For access management policy, uh, we have sample document control page with the document ID, uh, related documents, then confidentiality statement, these are the tables, and that's the objective. So for access control policy, everyone should follow uh, this document. Now, roles and responsibilities for CISO. CISO uh, is responsible to oversee the implementation and enforcement of this policy for so review and approve access management policy. Uh, IT security team. IT or security team responsible to ensure they have access management requirements. They are in place and enforce these requirements. Uh, similarly, BU heads or project managers. So employees uh, under their supervision, they comply with the policy. And for employees and contractors, they are responsible to read this access management policy. If they have any queries, ask to the relevant document owner and provide the feedbacks and report any, any violations of this policy. Now the scope of this policy, it applies to all uh, employees, contractors, management or company owners, external business partners. And this scope should be in line with our SOC2 scope. So for access management, uh, we have these many devices. So the in-scope devices would be applied for the policy. We have these many servers. So how we are providing access to these servers for any employee and for the software application details. So example, we have Jira, we have Sonacube, GitLab, so whenever there is a new joinee, how we are providing access to that new joinee for GitLab, say example, for SonarCube. So this uh, SOC2 asset scoping is there. So uh, apart from that, it applies to all employees, contractors, management company or owners and external business partners. Now for control of access, we have user access lifecycle. We follow uh, some of the best practices like principle of least privilege, separation of duties, uh, restricted uh, user accounts. So every employee should have a non-admin access to their laptops. This is a default access. And if they need any admin access, they request to the IT team or support team. Uh, critical uh, access suggests uh, privilege access or administrator user access to sensitive uh, information it should be logged, like who is accessing what kind of data and from what IP, at what time. So these details should be logged. Uh, we do have a user access lifecycle. For a new user, there should be a new uh, user registration and all user must be uniquely identified. So example, it should be an email address or phone number. It, we have a centrally managed identity providers like we have Azure AD example. So every user should have a unique uh, unique item that should be the user identification. And the approval cycle. So once it is approved, so access request must be formally initiated. So if an employee needs access to any application, uh, there should be a service ticket. It should be for coming from uh, some kind of ticketing tool. Or if the company does not have this ticketing tool, uh, a formal email request should be triggered to a respective department. If the user is a privileged user or an admin user, or a user is needing access to any critical system, example, a normal user needs access to production system, there should be minimum two approval levels. Uh, example could be L1 approval from manager, L2 approval from security or team or BU head. Uh, access provisioning. So once the services, service request is triggered and it's approved, the IT team, which means the team was taking care of servers, application, they provide access based on uh, the form, access form. And all the details should be documented. Like what is the requested date time, approval requested date time, and how long the access is being granted? Is it for just for one, uh, like one day or one month, 
So all these details should be uh, documented. So we have something called as just-in-time access or temporary access. Uh, so this should be automated tools uh, our company should use to disable the access after that time. Now actually uh, access deprovisioning. Whenever any employee or staff or contractor leaves uh, leaves the reporting manager or HR leaves uh, leaves uh, the company, so employee can leave company or employee could move to other department. So we have to take care of both the scenarios. So what usually I have seen, company or organization they do take care when an employee uh, leaves their organization, but they do not keep in mind that the employee is moving to any other project or any other department. There also we need to do access deprovisioning. Okay, so if any uh, employer staff contractor moves to other department or they leave the company or organization, then there should be deprovisioning within 24 hours after everything is approved and done then it should be deprovisioned uh, within 24 hours it should be well documented also and this should be tracked centrally we can use some tools to centrally uh, track all, all these requests okay now access reviews a formal review must be done by system owner now who is a system owner so example, if we have these assets in a list, so for GitLab Enterprise example, so we should have a application owner or system owner. So GitLab owner may be some kind of IT person. For Sona Cube, it could be security team. For Jira, it could be project management. So similarly for servers, this is one system. And for this system, this is the asset owner. And this is the system owner. So for every system, we should have a system owner. And this system owner is responsible uh, to review all the access uh, of the users, what they have on their system. For example, on this server, on this server, owner one at the rate this email ID is responsible to check what are the all the users and what access they have on this uh, server machine. Uh, so this should be done at least quarterly for all critical system and every six months for all other systems and this details from the system owner it should be shared to security team uh, emergency access there might be cases like employee needs emergency access to fix a production I uh, issue so for that we have some proper business justification and we may skip some of the process uh, to get the emergency access, but afterwards uh, it should be documented and reviewed. Dormant account management. So any user ID which is inactive for 55 consecutive days, then it uh, first should be alerted. By example, uh, an alert should go to the email ID, uh, looping the reporting manager, okay. You have not been using the system for 45 days, so we will disable the access. And after such some reminders, example three reminders sent, then we can uh, temporarily disable the access. And if any person needs it back, so it will have again a formal request and then they can re-enable the access. And if the account is inactive for 120 days, it will be permanently deactivated. Now. Privilege user access management. All administrator user or privilege user, as we discussed, they should have two level of approvals. Here we have written minimum three level of approvals. So if the uh, if the system is critical, example production, it should have minimum three level of approvals. First from the application owner, second from the BU head or project manager and the final one from the security team then the application then the access would be granted to that user and all privilege account must be protected by multi-factor authentication okay so remote access so for remote access employee needs uh, to enable vpn to get access to vpn protected by a multi-factor authentication First, employee need to connect to the VPN from company-managed laptops. Okay, 
and then it should be connected to VPN. So there might be requirements if employee wants to connect from personal laptop, then they should first connect to a secure VDI. Example could be Amazon Workspace or Azure VDI. And from inside there, they can connect to VPN and can access company, company assets from there. Third party access. So all third parties like vendors, partner, consultants, uh, they also should sign contractual agreements uh, of, for confidentiality policy and accept, acceptable use policy clauses. Uh, so after that, the access would be granted. And this follow all the cycle, like access provisioning, then deprovisioning, gathering the requirements, why this third party need access to this uh, resource, following all the approval levels. So uh, this, they have all these requirements, what we have seen for the normal employee. And access must be revoked once the project or contract is over or ended by the third party. Uh, so the application or system owner or HR team should, uh, so security team should be notified when, whenever a project is ended and then they can take the next steps. Now, apart from these, these are other which are standard, uh, standard bullet points like employee training and awareness. All employees uh, or contractors, vendors, they should undergo this training uh, 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 when they are onboarding and at least once a year. And this is compliance and monitoring. Escalation metrics. So this uh, contact person may change depending on the policy. This is access management policy. We may have a different uh, point of contact, level 1, level 2, and level 3. And policy exceptions. If anyone wants exception to this access management policy, we should follow this document. Uh, policy review and updates. It should be reviewed. This complete access management policy document, it should be reviewed at least once a year or if there is any a major change. Uh, feedbacks from employee stakeholders should be taken care for continuous improvement. And that's the conclusion. Yeah. So that's it on to access management policy. There might be uh, some items you want to add it here. Kindly uh, comment down whatever your thoughts and we can take a look at that. Thank you.